In this screencast, we are going to discuss the patterns of interstitial opacities. At the end of this screencast, in conjunction with the prior screencast on patterns, you should be able to differentiate airspace opacities from interstitial opacities. And you should start to be able to use basic terminology to describe the patterns of disease on chest x-ray and on CT. When I think about interstitial opacities, I tend to break them down into three simple categories. Lines, or thickening of the interlobular septa, dots or nodules, and cysts. Let's look a little bit closer at the basic anatomic unit that we can see on CT. Again, we call this the secondary pulmonary lobule, and it is composed of three basic elements. The center of the lobule, is going to be composed of a terminal bronchial and pulmonary artery. We then have the asini, which are clusters of alveoli surrounding the center of the pulmonary lobule. And then we have the interlobular septa. And this interlobular septa is composed of fibrous connective tissue along with draining veins and draining lymphatics. I've made a graphical representation of these interlobular septa and how they appear on CT when you zoom in. The first thing that we'll discuss in interstitial lung disease is thickening of that interlobular septa. And if that thickening is smooth, it, we call that linear or smooth interlobular septal thickening. And that creates the appearance of lines both on chest x-rays and chest CTs. Thickening of the interlobular septa. Now let's look at some examples with graphical representations and some zoomed in chest CTs. On the left we see a graphical representation of that smooth interlobular septal thickening. And below that, we see a CT where the person has pulmonary edema. And that edema is causing fluid in the interlobular septa to make the interlobular septa more prominent. This fluid may be within congested veins, it may be within congested lymphatics, or it may be third spaced. But at this point, in this image, the fluid has not started to accumulate within the alveoli. Compare that to normal. On a normal patient, you should not see the interlobular septa. There is also intralobular septal thickening, sometimes referred to as reticulation. The intralobular septa are the fine connective tissue that are surrounding the asini and the alveoli that also contain the capillary beds of the lungs. If the intralobular septa become thickened, then you get a very fine ground glass appearance to the lungs because these septa are so small and they're surrounding individual asini. This is most commonly seen in fibrotic lung diseases and can mimic the ground glass opacity that we often see in more acute processes. Now let's look at a case example. Here we have a chest radiograph. Take a moment to look at the radiograph and decide if you think the process is diffuse, lower lobe predominant or upper lobe predominant, and then to decide if you see airspace opacities or interstitial opacities. When I look at this radiograph, the first thing I notice is more lines throughout the chest x-ray than I normally expect on a standard patient with no complaints. Particularly over here, we can see multiple little perpendicular lines adjacent to the pleura that are often referred to as curly bees lines. Because of the linear appearance of this diffuse abnormality in the lungs, 
I think this is an interstitial process, so an interstitial opacity as opposed to an airspace opacity. If we zoom in on that lung, you can see these fine lines going to the periphery, and then elsewhere throughout the chest x-ray, you can notice these little lines, which are sometimes called reticular opacities or interstitial opacities. If we look at the chest CT in that same person, we can see some of these areas of smooth septal thickening. The smooth septal thickening, when it's occurring around the secondary pulmonary lobule, often takes on a geometric shape, sometimes cuboid, but more commonly hexagonal or pentagonal. And if we zoom in on those, you can maybe see those pentagons and hexagons starting to form due to that smooth septal line thickening. Here's a really nice example of a couple pentagons up against the pleural surface. And when we put that in coronal, you can see the correlate for your Curly's lines, which are these vertical or horizontal perpendicular lines coming out from the pleura. This process was acute. It's diffuse with smooth septal line thickening. There is a small pleural effusion that we can see right here on the x-ray and CT. There was also a pericardial effusion that was apparent on the CT, and the heart was in and this is a case of pulmonary edema. In this case, it's an interstitial edema that hasn't progressed to the degree that the air spaces are beginning to opacify with fluid. Another pattern that we see in interstitial lung disease is a nodular pattern. Okay, and the nodular pattern, as opposed to being smooth thickening of the interlobular septa, are discrete nodules, often micronodules, but sometimes the nodules can approach 5 to 10 millimeters. Often the nodules are very small in the range of 1 to 2 millimeters. When the nodules are along the interlobular septa and along the pleura, we call these perilymphatic nodules. So let's look at a few different patterns of dots and talk about the terminology we use to describe them. These are all different micronodular patterns. On the left, we see a centrolobular nodule pattern. These nodules are relatively well-defined and solid appearing, and they occur in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule, hence the term centrolobular nodule. You can see the CT down here, these fine micronodules, some get even bigger, approaching five millimeters. Notice we don't see any nodularity along the pleura, and that's one of the best things you can look for to try and distinguish centrolobular nodules from perilymphatic or random nodules, which we see on the right-hand side of the screen. Notice the nodules studding the fissure and along the pleura, in these perilymphatic nodules versus that subpleural sparing in the central lobular nodules. The nodules here in the center are, I think, one of the most challenging to detect. These are ground glass micronodules in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. And without being able to scroll through the image, it's often very hard to even appreciate these nodules. So let's look at another case example. In this chest x-ray, I want you to pause, decide if you think the process is upper lobe or lower lobe predominant or diffuse, whether it's isolated to one lung or both lungs, and whether it's an interstitial process or an airspace process. When I look at this chest radiograph, the first thing I notice is the increased density in this right lung compared to the left lung. And I'll go ahead and tell you the left lung is normal. When I look at the right lung and try to decide if this is an interstitial process or an airspace process, I notice lots of little fine lines and almost like little grains of rice throughout the chest radiograph. And that starts to take me into an interstitial process as opposed to that more solid or patchy appearance that we see with airspace opacity. If we look at the chest CT in this same patient, again, notice that the left lung is normal and the right lung is abnormal. 
and it actually has septal line thickening, but instead of being a smooth septal line thickening, it's actually a nodular septal line thickening. So down here in particular, you can see nodules along the septa, and it just looks a little more irregular than that case of pulmonary edema we had before. It's also unique in that it's unilateral, and this is one of the more common reasons to have nodular septal line thickening, and it's lymphangitic carcinomatosis. So this person presented with chronic respiratory symptoms. It's a diffuse process, but it's unilateral with smooth and nodular septal line thickening. No pleural effusion, no cardiomegaly. And then this patient had a breast cancer that had spread through the lymphatics of So lymphangitic carcinomatosis. The final pattern we're gonna discuss are cysts. Cysts can manifest in different ways based on their underlying disease process. A cyst that we will see commonly associated with pulmonary fibrosis is called honeycombing. In honeycombing, you get at least two rows of stacked cysts with well-defined walls along the periphery of the lung. That contrasts to emphysema, where in emphysema, you will often have only one row of cysts along the pleura, or you will have cysts scattered throughout the lung, as in central lobular emphysema. And in both cases, the walls are very difficult to perceive. You can sometimes see some intervening lung tissue, but many of the cystic change that we see in the lung is ill-defined on its margins. And that's different than cystic lung disease. So true cysts in the lungs, whether they're pneumatoceles or they're from tuberous sclerosis or lymphangiomyomatosis, will often have well-defined walls around each cyst. And we'll get more into the different types of cystic lung disease in a future lecture on diffuse and interstitial lung disease. In summary, interstitial opacities have a very unique differential compared to airspace opacities. And so it's important to recognize when the primary pathology in the lung is involving the interstitium. Lines, dots, and cysts are the most common interstitial patterns. So start to recognize those fine lines, fine dots, or cystic change in the lung, and compare that to the prior podcast where we were looking at airspace opacities. Remember that many diffuse diseases have a combination of patterns. And if you can start to pick up on the standardized language for describing the findings in the lung, you can better interpret the reports you get from the radiologists, and you can also go out and seek information in the literature more effectively when you're faced with findings that you're less familiar with.